Hello, good evening to you and welcome to News 360. We are live from the News Hub at Adesoe, Kanda. I'm Natalie Ford. And my name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up in the bulletin tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... The two former Guantanamo Bay detainees, Mahmoud Umar Mohammed bin Atif and Khalid Mohammed Sali Abdullah, stayed in Ghana as refugees. Uh, Deputy Defense Minister justifies the killing of cut cattle by security personnel undertaking oper Operation Kaole at the Aobo A in, in the Ashanti region. Also ahead this evening, traders at the newly constructed race course market in Kumasi threaten to return to the streets if city authorities fail to get their colleagues to join them. And also in business this evening, we'll put a spotlight on Accra's growing property market. And on the international front tonight, former Nigerian President, Obas President Obasanjo advises incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari against seeking re-election next year. We've got the details of these stories for you here on News 360, including the latest of news from the world of sports and entertainment, and we're streaming live all across the world on 3news.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Let's go on to our first story uh, this evening. And remember to join us with the views, the comments, and opinions. Uh, two former Guantanamo Bay detainees, Mahmoud Umar Mohammed Bain Atef and Khalid Mohammed Sali Al Dubi, uh, to stay in Ghana as refugees. Now, the agreement covering their stay in Ghana expired on January 6th. But in a statement to Parliament Tuesday, the Foreign Affairs Minister said no exit arrangement was originally discussed between Ghana and the United States to end the bilateral agreement at the time of the negotiation. The two former Guantanamo Bay detainees have been in the country for two years. Their stay expired on January 6, 2018. There were calls on government to make their fate known. The Foreign Affairs Minister Shelly Ayokoboki told Parliament the two ex-detainees who have been in Ghana with their families have been of good behavior. She however revealed they have become the responsibility of the country because discussions with the U.S. government revealed there was no agreement on their return. It is to be noted that no exit arrangements were originally discussed between the two governments to end the bilateral arrangement at the time of negotiation. The U.S. has also been clear in our discussions with them that per the agreement, returning them to the United States is not an option open to discussion or negotiation. This means that all obligations relating to the two subjects has now become the responsibility of Ghana. The minister indicated government is constrained under the circumstances to explore other options but will await an in-depth examination of the matter by the appropriate agencies. Mr. Speaker, in exploring options open to government, we have hit two hurdles. The first hurdle being that the agreement that was signed between the previous government and the United States stipulates that, and I quote, the government of Ghana is to take measures to facilitate the integration of Mr. Bin Atef and Mr. Al Dubi into Ghanaian society, unquote. What this means what this means is that while the United States obligations end after two years, Ghana's obligations continue even after that. In addition, and even more significant, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Interior has informed my ministry of records at the Refugee Board, which reveal that the government at the time granted the two detainees refugee status. Mahmoud Omar Mohammed bin Atef and Khalid Mohammed Saleh Al Dubi were brought to Ghana in 2016 after having been in detention at Guantanamo Bay for 14 years after being linked with the terrorist group Al Qaeda, but were brought for two years. 
Still on this issue, the minority in Parliament has asked government to revoke the Refugees Act if it cannot host the two ex-Guantanamo Bay detainees as refugees in the country. This was after the majority MPs insisted that the NDC government's arrangement to make it difficult to send the two ex-detainees back home. MP for North Tong and the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Samuel Okujeta Blakwa, wanted clarification from the Foreign Affairs Minister as to when the two former Guantanamo Bay detainees status as refugees will expire since the country's refugees laws are not permanent. If uh, we are to admit that there was no discussion of an exit strategy, does it mean that in the ensuing discussions with the U.S. authorities and uh, the new administration, when the agreement was being presented to this house, was there still no discussion uh, for an exit strategy? The majority maintains it will be difficult to send the two back home, insisting the previous government had hidden certain information from the current government. You have tied in the hands of the people of Ghana at the back, then you come out in the air shouting as if you knew nothing about it. Meanwhile, you took the decision to make the refugees. You took the decision to make it very difficult for anybody to send that out. At a government we took over 7 January 2017. The leadership of this country are today telling parliament and the people of Ghana that the very Gedmo II, which some of them variously describe as terrorists, they are now only getting to know today that we are granted refugee status. After one solid year, you didn't know one year in government, you didn't know or you didn't want to know. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, there is a section in the Refugee Act, Section 15, it reads, Withdrawal of Refugee Status. The board may withdraw the recognition of where the board considers that there are reasonable grounds for believing that a person who has been recognized as a refugee should not have been given that status. So, if, 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 if you have a problem, invoke the law and do what is appropriate. It is within the law. It is within the law. This pretense, this pretense must stop. This pretense must stop. Invoke it. It is in July, we are told, July 21st, 2016, that they were accorded refugee status. So what would have expected? that in the handing over notes, this additional information would have been provided to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This, unfortunately, was not transmitted. It was not part of the handing over notes. And the Honorable Ayariga, I'm quoting his words, he said, there is no reason why the people should remain in this country. If indeed that is true, how do you situate that in the context of the refugee status that the government of yesterday granted them. We can't blow hot and cold. And we should not be playing to the gallery when the facts point to a different direction. We cannot be doing that. I'm happy. The but Minister for National Security, Albert Kandapa, who was in the House, urged the MPs to desist from partisan arguments and try to resolve the matter. The decision to let him go or not does not just rest on government, but on him. The people must agree to go. It changes the whole equation. And these are the two problems that we are facing, which I believe this House should help them to resolve. Instead of politicizing it and making statements, which to me is not going to help. Okay, so let's just stay a bit further. Well, there's a minority in Parliament has over the past seven days chastised government over its failure to bring the agreement allowing the two as Gitmo detainees to stay in the country before parliament for ratification. So minority spokesperson on foreign affairs, Samuel Kuja Tua in an earlier interview questioned government's seeming silence on the matter. What you need to do at the initial stage is to prompt government, is to urge government to be minded to avert their attention to this clear breach of Article 75.2 and to demand action. So that's what we are doing at this initial stage. Uh, we do not get the impression that 
um, uh, government uh, would want to uh, flout uh, the constitution and disregard the Supreme Court to the to I mean beyond what they have done already. I'm telling you that I'm telling you that the indication that we are getting from the majority leader, you heard him since I raised the matter, he says that they are trying to uh, close in on a decision. Uh, so they, it's, it's, I don't get the impression that they are being belligerent or they are adopting a posture that is, if you like, adamant and, and, and probably saying that we don't care. So uh, to, the extent that, to the extent that they are saying that very soon we'll get a decision, uh, we can only ask them to, 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 act, to act expeditiously because already they are in breach. And we offer them an opportunity with the recall of parliament on the 5th of January, which we thought that they would have utilized. And even before the 5th of January, you knew since August that this agreement will expire on the 6th of January. And if you check the parliamentary records, I said during the ratification that it's important that the executive quickly reopen discussion with the Americans so that the future of the two will be determined. And I'm surprised that uh, the advice that we proffered appear to have been ignored and then the executive has been taken uh, by surprise. They've been caught flat-footed. We, we were in this house on the 22nd of December. Uh, that's sufficiently close to the 6th of January. There was, there was, there was no uh, agreement from the executive to parliament. Then they had a second opportunity on the 6th of January, on the 5th of January, when uh, 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 we, 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 we asked for a recall of parliament. Again, they didn't utilize that opportunity. This is the first week of uh, this session of, of parliament. And in the business statement, we do not see it expressly stated that they will take action on this matter. So we are going to continue to mount the pressure uh, and, and demand that uh, our Supreme Court is respected, that our Constitution, Article 75-2, is adhered to. We are going to continue to, to mount the pressure. So this was an interview that Samuel Okuyo to Blackhawk granted the media earlier, a proud to this particular revelation by the Foreign Affairs Minister. And that raises the question as to whether when they did know that uh, a refugee status had already been granted, these two, they were asking government to come clean on uh, the decision for these two to still remain in Ghana after the expiration of their period. I've been joined on the telephone by Dr. Vladimir Chidan. So he is an international relations expert to help us understand uh, this. I thank you very much for your time this evening, sir. Now, I, were you surprised to hear this, uh, as many were, that these two had been granted refugee status as far back as 2016, a year after the case was sent to Supreme Court, and then the court even determined a six to one ruling that the, the agreement was actually not based on law. Well, it is, uh, it's mind boggling. It's a little infuriating. It insults the sensibilities uh, of, of some of us because all along the whole thing has been shrouded in some kind of secrecy. Uh, in my field, I think we have all discussed this before. It's not proper to have a negotiation which doesn't have uh, an exit clause how to get out of that negotiation. It's not also true that you negotiate in diplomatic circles when you don't have anything to gain and you say compassionate grounds. And so it is because of all these that we don't know that we are now in this lacuna. It's very unfortunate and I'm really, very, very angry with the previous government and with this government also, the way we are handling this issue. You can't just negotiate somebody's insecurity to become part of your insecurity. I mean, it's outrageous. I can't believe that the time they were telling us how they came in, part of the clause was that uh, they have been given refugee status for them to be permanent here or whatever it is. It, no, government must come out to tell us something more because I, I just don't understand. You know, the Foreign Affairs Minister made uh, reference to part of the agreement which read that efforts were to be made to integrate this two into the Ghanaian society. I mean... That, what, what, what my anger camps, because in 2016, when we were talking about this, remember, I was the first to write about this. In absolutely. When we had wind that Ghana was going to take between 5 and 15. Paid attention to that. In 2016, they came. And again, I was, it was outrageous. I said, look, it's going to be a problem. What did we gain? We were told we gained nothing. The word was nothing. 
compassionate grounds we brought them in. Not know we brought them in as refugees. So it's like lies have been told to Ghanaians, which is wrong. But this government has a way out. We, we need to. And I'm surprised that the opposition is now talking about pressure and doing this and the law. Did they didn't know the law that we are not a monist country, we are a dualist country. And that when the president has agreed on anything, it must come before parliament. And then from parliament, we must be informed. Ghanaians must be informed. How can they be refugees right now? And then we, don't, we seem to be important in, in the face of somebody's insecurity that we have acquired on ourselves. So then we, we, we as well go for, for refugees from Syrian war or Congo war on compassionate ground. Certainly there is something which is amiss, and we must be made clear about this. We shouldn't play politics with it. It is our country. Absolutely. But if you say that this government has a way out, what exactly is the way out? Especially when there's we do no, know that no whatever decision has to be taken anywhere in the world will have to be with except their consent. War, even in war times. When you have resorted to war, then the war can have its own way of ending through maybe another negotiation, even in war. So there is no negotiation that cannot be revealed. I'm surprised today that they say there is a document. If you remember last uh, 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 two years ago when we were debating this, it was, we were made clear that there was no document. It's a note verbal. That's a short note just telling Ghana government, take the two and that kind of thing. But now we are told that there is an agreement which makes it uh, a fait accompli. I mean, it can't be. But you can always go back and renegotiate. If only if this government doesn't want to. Uh, you can even renegotiate and get something out of it if the previous government says that we didn't get anything. Let's go for something. Why should the taxpayer now pay for the refugee status of this, these guys? Somebody should tell me, if we got nothing, why are we paying for their stay in Ghana? So you, you, you expect that this, this, this government will go ahead and do this. But I've been joined on the telephone, the other telephone by uh, Masawood Mohammed, who is a member of parliament for the... Pru West constituency, I must say, a member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Odomo. Good evening to you. Now, <laughs> with what the Foreign Affairs Minister is telling us uh, this evening, there was no exit plan in this whole agreement. And as a matter of fact, you did not even add it to the handing over notes if what the uh, majority leader in Parliament is, is telling us is anything to go by. Thank you very much and uh, uh, for the opportunity. I, I think the issue is very clear right from the onset. The current majority, when they were in minority, right from the onset cried foul about the whole arrangement of bringing the GETMO2 into this country. And they have cried foul. Very fortunately, they are now in government. And they have the opportunity to correct whatever mistakes that the Mohammed-led administration made on this get more to. But for them to start, I mean, uh, uh, crying foul as they did at the initial stage is neither here nor there. No, no honorable, what I ask, I ask, hold on a minute. Honorable, if you indulge me, I ask a specific what question. What would be the right decision to take now okay. going forward? I asked because, a specific question, yes, Honorable, if, 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 if you would indulge me. I asked a specific question that yes. as you went into this agreement, there yes. was no exit plan. And this particular administration is saying that you did not even communicate it to them in your handing over notes. Is that well, the case? And secondly... Whether it's been communicated in the handing over notes or not, they have the state in their hands today. The scripture of the state is in their hands. They have to study the background of the Get More To, analyze their uh, 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 stay in Ghana. After having gotten the opportunity to do so for one year, they cannot still be crying as if they don't know them at all. At least for the one year they have studied them, whether it's been stated in the handing over note or not, this is not the time for them to cry that they have not gotten the information in the handing over note. What but is good for Ghanaians now is that going forward, what is the current government decision on the two? What is the decision of the current government 
on the stay of these people. But Honorable, what did you did you know? Honorable, did, did you know? I mean, you are a member of the minority in parliament. For the past yes. couple of weeks, you have been on yes. government's heels to come yes. out with their decision on the Gitmo 2. Did yes. you yes. know that you, I mean, while in power in 2016, yes. had granted this to refugee status? Did you know about this? No. You didn't know? It is not today that this current government has come to tell Ghanaians that we have been, uh, the two have been given refugee status. No. Since when have they discovered? No. Uh, since, uh, the, since when has the Minister no, no, for no. Foreign Affairs discovered that these two were given refugee status? This information should have been given to the general public before today. Absolutely. So That's what I'm, I'm, that I'm saying to you, Honorable, that, ho oh, oh, please, uh, yes. please, listen. Now, you, in 2016, yes. took a decision to grant this to refugee status. Yes. Dominic, the Honorable Dominic Ayene has confirmed who was the, yes, then, the Deputy yes. Attorney General. Yes. Now, you were saying that yes. it was incumbent on whoever took the decision to let the general public know, right? Yes. You were in power. You took yes. that decision and you did not think about even letting parliament you are saying you did not even know about it our representatives yes. Re in remember that remember that the hula balu surrounding the gate mode two was that government did not disclose uh, much of the information to the general public to the extent that the well, previous government did yes. not bring the the agreement for ratification so are they also going to repeat the mistakes no, now are, you are you are you admitting that you made a mistake we, then? The Ghanaians do not expect you to repeat what we are. If we have given them a, a, a refugee status, our leader no, was but, clear but, uh, on the floor today. The, the, the point is, we cannot yes, be please. running a country by making mistakes and are, are, are expecting that another would come and correct it when we admit a mistake had been made. Well, that mistake was already made and they cried foul. So today, if they had taking the governance of this country, wouldn't they co correct the mistake? Are they going to continue on that tangent? No. That is why many people are called. So if we had no, uh, uh, what call it, uh, exit plan, are they going to leave them like that to stay without still giving them an exit plan? That is what we want them to come clear. What is the way forward? Will they uh, uh, abrogate the uh, 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 permit for them to become refugees? or they will give them that refugee status for them to stay. Are they going to regularize them in the Ghanaian communities, or they will send them back to their home countries, not necessarily America? These oh, no. are issues that they must come clear, so that we will know. That is all what Ghanaians are asking for. I, I see. Well, thank you for your time this evening. And I, I'm grateful. That's uh, Masawood Mohammed is a member of parliament for Pru West. Matter of fact, a member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. Let's turn to some other stories this evening. The Deputy Defence Minister has justified the killing of cattle by security personnel undertaking the Operation Cowleg exercise at Agogo in the Ashanti region. He spoke with our reporter, Catherine Frimpomar. There has been a standoff between farmers and nomadic herdsmen at Agogo over the destruction of farms by cattle for more than 25 years. A Kumasi High Court in 2012 ordered the evacuation of the animals from the area, but the herdsmen did not comply with the directive. About 200 police and military personnel were deployed in Asantia Chemagogo to enforce the directive. Security personnel were advised to defend themselves following attacks by suspected herdsmen. This led to the murder of some herdsmen and hundreds of animals, an act that has been widely condemned. Security experts have condemned your, your strategy that it is not sustainable and it's even against uh, the UN Convention in the Protection of Animal Rights. Oh, Shooting and killing. yeah, dear beautiful sister, I advise you to follow the, the operation. And if a cow is coming to put it's horns in between your, your two ties and throw you off. Uh, you, you, you say that, and the, the soldier stands looking at you for the, the cow to do justice to you. That is where you know the difference between you know, protecting you as a civilian and then the soldier as well. Then you as a journalist, 
Then you come by and say, oh, it's against human rights for you to kick him and then save my life. But that is what we are saying. That's the best strategy. Is that the best strategy? The best strategy is to achieve the aim of defending you. According to the Deputy Defense Minister, the exercise has been successful. Please, and a lot of them have moved. Now about 90, 90 is 5 percent, no job is complete in, uh, in Agogo. So the exercise has been successful. Very, very, very successful. Very, 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 very successful. On the general security situation in the country, he thinks the NPP government has done better compared to the NDC administration. I'm using the past, and I'm telling you that all those perpetrations were, 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 were made, all those acts were perpetrated against citizens of Ghana, and nothing was done. Now, something is done. That is the difference, I'm saying. So if I don't refer to the past, what is, what is being done is that that seeds that were sown has generated, and therefore we are operating the seed by arresting and prosecuting and putting punishment on those who are, who are committing this crime. Now, overall government um, achievement, we're told, is reasonable according to uh, the progress towards implementing some of the promises made in its 2016 manifesto. This was the verdict of the E-Manifesto 2018. It was an assessment of the NPP's first year in office by Imani Ghana's policy think tank is, however, cautioning government to be wary of just taking off promises from a checklist without solving actual problems. The Manifesto is a periodic analytical report by Imani Ghana, a policy think tank that helps to determine the feasibility of manifesto promises, the level of execution of such promises, and its impact on citizens. The exercise, which previously rated government in quantitative terms, with marks between 0 and 100 percent, adopted a qualitative methodology this time around. What we sought to do qualitatively really uh, was to look at the manifesto promises. So you take every sector, what did the government said it was going to do there. And ultimately, everything cannot be done this year. But the manifesto doesn't tell you what will be done this year and what will not be done this year for all of them. I mean, for some of the things, they gave clear timelines. Others, they didn't. And so it's very difficult to tell what is going to be done in subsequent years. But there's a medium-term development plan which will capture these things. And so we look at the medium-term development plan as well to see if the government is actually thinking that they're going to implement these things over the, over the, over the, over the long term. The assessment centered on key sector indicators such as the economy, health, education, energy, infrastructure and governance. The government was assessed based on the 147 economic promises in its manifesto, 73 on governance, 25 on education, 45 on health, 37 on energy and 73 on infrastructure. According to the report, government has made some progress in achieving the 147 economic promises in 2016. Trade and industry, revenue mobilization, increase in agriculture, job creation and the One District, One Factory initiative were some of the positive variables that scored high. I think that's a crux of a message to Ghanaians that they appear to be on track, but there are things that they need to look at, if not. And by the end of the fourth, fourth year, we'll, we'll, we will rather wake up and be laughing on the wrong sides of our mouth. The restoration of the nursing and teacher trainee allowances and free SHS policy were some of the high points for the government under the education sector. There were, however, concerns on equity versus quality as well as logistics and financial sustainability. You're still live here on News 360. We've got some business news for you coming up in a few moments' time. Stay with us. You're still watching News 360, and it's time for business. Good evening. My name is Nanikia Mensah Brampa. Now, some financial analysts have commended the Bank of Ghana, cautioning the public on transacting business in digital currencies such as Bitcoin. At a news conference in Accra, the governor of the central bank, Dr. Ernest Anderson, explained Bitcoin is not yet legal in the country. 
Bank of Ghana at its monetary policy conference notified the public that Bitcoin is not a legal tender in the country, cautioning the public to be circumspect on the use of the digital currency. The governor said the central bank is deepening its laws on electronic and financial transactions in line with international standards, adding a new electronic payment system act, which will be passed by parliament in some few months, will further enhance the payment and settlement system, including digital forms of money. Bitcoin is a form of digital currency created and held electronically. No one controls it and they are produced by people using software that solves mathematical problems. Banking consultant Dr. Richmond Etuahini says since the virtual currency cannot be controlled, the steps taken by the central bank is necessary. It's, it's uncontrollable currency. So anything that is not controlled or regulated, as the price shoot up, there will be a day the price can also drop to zero balance. And people who go there and buy those investments will be on the losing side. Financial analyst on TV3's flagship business program, Business Focus, similarly agreed with the central bank's position. The number of people who are all getting involved in this uh, Bitcoin business and think they have found some magic wand that would deliver. As an investment analyst, you described as a high-risk investment it, venture. It, and it's very, no, not just high-risk, very speculative. <laughs> and, Extremely and speculative. What's the level of volatility? I mean... Extraordinary. In a day, you can drop. Oh, did I say in a day? In two hours, it can drop about twenty-seven percent. Yes. On a normal exchange, nobody would even allow oh, an asset, asset to drop, to drop that by that much. Percent. <laughs> in, in even a day, did you get it? So yeah. uh, remember, it's not illegal, mm -hmm. but you are engaging in a very speculative venture. You can lose money, you can gain money, and uh, it all it's, it's. And you know, I am yet to meet one single person who can tell you exactly, exactly what why it is <laughs> happening. <laughs> the value of one Bitcoin shot up by almost 1,300% from $999 in January 2017 to $13,800 on December 31st, 2017. And in more news tonight, Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry Robert Aumkalenti says Ghana's interests will be safeguarded in the implementation of the EPA. He was speaking at the first meeting of the steering committee under the Interim Economic Partnership Agreement between Ghana and the EU in Accra. The meeting marked a concrete step in the implementation of the EPA. The parties reaffirmed their commitment to the Interim EPA as a mechanism for dialogue and partnership, as well as a tool to foster development and reinforce regional integration. The parties discussed and exchanged information in respect of rules of origin, liberalization schedule, institutional setup, and the monitoring of the EPA. Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry Robert Ahum Khan Lindsay assured that every detail in the agreement will be scrutinized. The, the detail is very important because if you don't get the detail, then you may not achieve where you want to go. So the sorts of details we're looking at are things like rules of origin, um, what the progressive nature of opening of each other's markets are, what are some of the things we need to do to make sure that Ghana can export products rather than just primary, so equip, um, industrialized products. What are some of the things the EU is keenly ensuring to try and make sure its market also gets access to Ghana because it's a two-way process. Europe remains Ghana's most reliable trade partner with over 2.3 billion euros of export to the EU in 2016. Uh, is, uh, I think it's important that it's taking place one year after the ratification of the, of the agreement. It's looking at things like the rules of origin, which are, which are important. We also want to look at the wider ECOWAS region, uh, and we see in the future Europe working with the, with the whole of West Africa, and Ghana perhaps as a leader uh, in West Africa. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire are the two countries which have this particular agreement with us, Interim Economic Partnership Agreement, and we see Ghana doing well already, competing on our market, and, and there are lots of other possibilities in the future to add value in Ghana and also to access our, our market. The EPA is expected to provide duty-free and quota-free access to all Ghana's exports, agricultural or manufactured, to the EU market. Ghana is also expected to gradually liberalize imports from the EU. 
It's still News 360. This is the business segment. And let's talk about issues on property and across property market is booming for developers, but very expensive for purchase or rent by prospective customers. Uh, airport residential area currently stands as the capital's most expensive area and it is mostly patronized by expatriates. The skylines are brightening, the buildings are getting taller, bolder, and the prices are inching up. Airport residential area, cantonments, East Ligon, and recently Spintex. These are the major names that come to mind when you talk of luxury commercial and residential properties in Accra. In mid-2013, the average price of a house in Accra was 315,000 Ghana cities equivalent to 69,306.30 US dollars. Five years on, housing prices have increased. At the airport residential area, the most notable residential property in the area is Villaggio Vista, an apartment in its high-end, 22-floor towering residential address cost not less than $400,000 and not more than $900,000 when furnished. Yes, not affordable to the ordinary Guinean. Jemima Fenteng Chum is the sales executive at Shandonia Properties. In airport residential area, um, a land is in the range of one million US dollars. Note, um, that's just a plot of land, that's a standard plot of land. Um, the rent in the range of 300 US dollars and 5,000 US dollars or more. Um, this is because of the interest of people, as I said, the comfort, um, the serenity, the security, and then um, the um, proximity to the center of Accra. Um, sales of apartments range within 300,000 US dollars. Lately, I would say there's been lots of, um, lots of projects, lots of um, developmental projects, lots of businesses booming in the country right now, and we are getting more immigrants than before. So um, these people come, um, they settle, of course, and coming from the Western countries, I mean, they would want something which is similar to what they were living in in outside countries. Supervisor at Casabella Residence at Airport, speaking off camera, said most expatriates patronize the facility as compared to Ghanaians, with a 24-room apartment currently accommodating only one Ghanaian, whose rent is being covered by his organization. Statistics show the most expensive area in Accra currently is the airport residential area, with an average house priced at 950,000 Ghana cities, equivalent to 209,038 US dollars. Well, so those are snippets of the prizes, especially when you want to own one at airport residential area. We will bring you a full, uh, full story on that particular one on Accra property in subsequent bulletins. But that will do for business tonight. My name is Nanekia Mensah Bampa. Alfred Okanti is standing by. Yeah, thank you. Like, uh, I, I thought you were going to ask me what I can buy those houses. Because I know you can afford the $900,000 flats. Lovely. Now, to some story, the Teachers and Education Workers Union has, a, has also warned those influencing their members to defect from the union to stop because it has finally succeeded in receiving the 3.1 billion CDs pension fund released by the government. According to the General Secretary of Tewu, such defections would affect the strength of union and also undermine the investment portfolio of those who are to retire next year. According to the leadership of Tewu, it has received numerous complaints from its members that the union is not seeking their welfare and interest. Some members have also threatened to defect and join other unions. The aggrieved members accused their leadership for not facilitating the process of receiving the 3.1 billion cities pension fund released by government. The members again criticized the entire leadership for the fallout with other members of the 12 labor unions fighting their cause. The similar agitations among members of Tewu compelled the leadership of Tewu to warn those influencing their members to defect. The General Secretary Augustine Kabu said the union has already received its fair share of the 3.1 billion cities pension fund. For our members who are being misled that Tewu is not fighting for you, I want to correct that impression. Tewu has been upbeat and actively involved in these matters 
And we have gotten to the final stage that we all need to pat ourselves on our backs mm. and say, Ayiko to all of you and to the national leadership too as well. He again emphasized the amount has currently been invested into the bonds to accrue benefits for retirees. The regularity or the frequency of the flow is still coming. Mm. The last one we received was just um, December, which reflects the November's one. Mm. We are expecting the December one to come in this January. And that is, they have been consistent with that one. And we are excited about that. Augustine Cabo also asked governments to pay penalties accrued due to the delay of the transfer of funds to their fund managers. The issues of penalties on delays in releases, monthly releases, and the TPFA were specifically addressed within the agreement. And we expect government to make good of those agreements and the content therein. Let's turn to some other stories this evening. Former workers of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation have given management of the state broadcaster a 60-day ultimatum to pay their end-of-service benefits owed them since 2012. The retirees are also demanding the payment of 2% Provident Fund, which has not been settled since 2009. The former workers of the state broadcaster say they have been waiting close to 80 years for their end-of-service benefit to be paid them, but management and other stakeholders have turned a deaf ear to their plight. According to the retirees, a letter dated November 29, 2017, to notify management on their plight, which they copied the then Director General, Chairman of GBC Provident Fund Trustees, Board of Directors and the National Media Commission, did not receive any attention. We, the retired staff of GBC, vehemently wish to bring to the notice of the board, management, media commission, and the acting director general as regards the payment of our retirement benefits. We, the aggrieved retired staff, demand that GBC should pay our retirement uh, benefits from 2012 to date within 60 days. The retirees are demanding that GBC and the Provident Fund Trustees compute a 2% interest from 2009 to date and also be part of the calculation and computing process. The deductions went on. You, you, you check from, from below that a PF employer is there. When you calculate against your basic, basic it is 2%. Up from 2009 up to October 2011. Then we migrated to controller. And the GBC, GBC commitment on their part ceased, but it is only the workers 5% that is being deducted. And even those monies that were deducted and GBC is supposed to pay their commitment have not been paid. So we are demanding if they are if they paid, we want to, to know and then see the expenses of, of account. And then they, how the, the payment order into the Star Problem Fund was done. Fresh Prince Nana Kojua Fred will be back with some sports news after this to stay. Good evening. Welcome back to News 360 on TV3. My name is Anako Jafre with the sports update. Let's get into the details. Now, in start times, the official television rights holders of the Ghana Premier League and the FA Cup, in collaboration with the Ghana Football Association, ha organized the draw for the 2018 Gala Contest. The Gala competition, which used to usher in the season proper, went on um, hibernation for years but with the help of start times it has been revived to give clubs the opportunity to warm up themselves up for the season the start times gfa gala is said to be played on the third and fourth of february 2018 at the indium stadium in elmina each of the teams will receive an appearance fee of 2500 the semi-finalists will get five hundred dollars the runners-up will get a thousand dollars and the winner will get $2,000. On to some more news. And a local organizing committee of the 2018 Women's Cup of Nations say they are on course to stage a successful tournament 
ahead of a calf inspection team um, in the next three months. Committee Chairperson Frida Prempe has been speaking to TV3 Sports Nanekia Amankwa about their plans. The Women's Nations Cup is a good 10 months away, but with a calf inspection due in three months, the local organizing committee is determined to get the basics in place as soon as possible. In November this year, eight women's national teams from across the continent will gather for a tournament that has grown in prestige and stature over the years. LOC chairperson Frida Prempe is in no doubt Ghana will be ready. I've not given myself 10 months. I've given myself six months. Because the next six months, we need to get everything in order, everything in shape for the tournament to take off. We have put together a working document to aid us from day one till November when the tournament kicks off. We have a marketing campaign strategy here. We are done with our preparatory works. We have message development. We've done with all support women's football, women's empowerment through football, destination Ghana for the tournament. And we, we're saying that we all can do it. It's not only women. So it's now a challenge for us to do better up above what they did in Cameroon. The Accra and Cape Coast Sports Stadiums will host the tournament. While Cape Coast is in great condition, the Accra Sports Stadium, which is due to host the opening and final games, will undergo major renovation work. The LOC chairperson says the focus of the work at the moment on the main stadia and training facilities is to ensure that the pitches are in great condition. My challenge is how to fix our stadia and the changing rooms, the facilities that we have, because that is the crux of the whole issue. We are going to play on the field. They are going to use training pitches to train in between the times they play the tournament. So we need to fix all that. So we are going to work very hard. But the onus is on the, all of us, the media, the government, the ministry, to ensure that we get these facilities back to shape on time. On to our next story, Ghana forward David Akam, who joined Philadelphia Union from Chicago Fire, says that he is confident of hitting the ground running when the season kicks off. Akam says he's determined to repay the faith shown in him by the club. I think I have experienced both in losing and winning. In my first two years in Chicago, we, we, didn't, do, we didn't do well, but for me, I still managed to do good things in, in that team. So last year, also, one of my best is in MLS. So for me, I have enough experience to, to bring uh, something to this team. We have enough quality in this team already, so I just need to do my part, and hopefully we, we all uh, click and, and get the best results. Uh, I think that's, that's mostly my qualities, uh, being wide and try to isolate the players and get 1v1, that's, that's my quality. So uh, I think I will fit in perfectly in this system because we play 4-2-3-1 uh, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll get a chance and, and be 1v1 every time. And that's all the sports your news 360. My name is Anako Jaffe. Thanks very much for watching. There's more sports news with Michael OTJ on Sports Unlimited at 10.30. Good evening. You all come back. Let's now go for some international news. Former Nigerian President Olisengu Obasanjo has advised incumbent President Mahmoudou Buhari against seeking re-election next year. Mr. Obasanjo supported Mr. Buhari's election in 2015, but now he says the president should retire because of age and ill health. In an open letter, Mr. Obasanjo says he is disappointed with Mr. Buhari particularly because of what he calls his poor handling of Nigeria's economy. He adds that the president does not have a good understanding of Nigeria's social and economic dynamics and the country needs a younger leader. In response, Nigeria's Information Minister al Haj Lai Mohammed has said, President Mohamed Buhari's government takes the admonition by ex-president Olisengu Basanjo in good faith. You can get more on this and other international news on our website, 3news.com. On to some entertainment news this evening.
In entertainment news this evening, legendary South African jazz trumpeter and anti-apartheid activist Hugh Masekela passed on Tuesday morning at the age of 78. Co-founder and leader of Ghanaian Afropop band Dosibisa Teddy Osei has been utilizing the iconic trumpeter. He described him as a great friend and a prominent trumpeter who put Africa on the world map. Yeah, yeah. Boom, shake. Shake it. If you call a woman African, no man, no, 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 She goes, say, she goes, say, The world, and especially the music fraternity, woke up to a bad news. Legendary South African jazz trumpeter and saxophonist Hugh Masekela has died. And the world over, everybody is mourning him. We are joined by one of Africa's greatest saxophonists. He is a co-founder of legendary group Osibisa, Teddy Ose, and he's also saddened by this very development. It hasn't been easy for me at all. It's, it's, it's so sad, man. You know, I, I've, it's, it's been a prominent, very prominent African. All his songs are my favorite, especially Gracie in the Grass. You are saying it was big in the U.S.? Very big. Very big. It was a big hit. That put me across what, what, what he is, you know, at a very long, uh, young age. Even when he was in America, Right? He was all the time working towards freedom for South Africa, you know, and uh, uh, it's a, a big thing for, for South Africa to have got him to talk about South Africa uh, in his live music. Anytime he's on stage, he's talking about South Africa and the freedom and everything. Very, very big loss. You met him in 1962. And he played so many gigs, but how would you describe him? For me, he was a, 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 a great friend, um, a very famous uh, a trumpeter. He, he put uh, Africa on the on the world map for jazz, and I regard him very highly. You know, because when you talk about an African in, in jazz, he, he was there. So uh, it's, a, it's a big loss, but then, you know, we all have to go sometime. But uh, it's, it's a pity he has, he has to go now. Uh, the legend lives on. But actress and producer Yvonne Nelson is back to work after giving birth to her first child. My colleague Anthony Jackson was on set with her where she spoke about her experience as a mother. We're going to be bringing you that particular full interview on New Day tomorrow, uh, which starts at 6 a.m. through to 9 a.m. So make a date with the New Day team with Anthony Jackson's exclusive interview with Yvonne Nelson. Thank you for spending your 60 minutes with us here on News 360. On behalf of the rest of the team, we're grateful. My name is Alfred Okansi. And I'm Natalie Force. We've got more news on our website, 3news.com, and News at 10 will simulcast on our sister station, 3FM 92.7. Thanks so much for watching, and have a lovely evening.